Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another session of our talk series, Manan, which was started as a platform for exchange of ideas between professionals and novices. So today we are very happy to have with us one of our cherished faculty members, Professor Mustan Sir Dalvi. Uh, welcome, sir. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. So, uh, Professor Mustan Sir Dalvi is a poet, translator, and editor. He has three poems. Gruhahas of Cox, Cosmopolitan, and Walk. His poems have been translated into French, Croatian, and Marathi and Gujarati. His translations of Muhammad Akbal's Shikwa and Jawabe Shikwa from Urdu as Taking Issue and Allah's Answer have been called insolent and heretical. He is the editor of Man Without a Navel, a collection of translations of Heman Devate's poems from Marathi. And he currently teaches at uh, teaches architecture in Sir J J College of Architecture. And uh, today's talk is titled "Memory, Poetry, and Architecture." And we're looking forward to what you have to say uh, for on this topic, sir. And the audience can note that they can post their questions in the chat box on Zoom as well as on Facebook Live, and that those will be answered after the talk. So I think we can start with your presentation now, sir. Thank you, uh, everyone. all of you who have organized manan not only for my session but all the uh, many events that you have already done uh, manan has been a very important uh, way in which all the students have come together throughout the duration of the lockdown and has been one of the better things i think that have happened in the last year which as you know has been a very unpredictable so i'm glad that uh, it is my turn to uh, make a presentation i am thankful to you all for the opportunity to do that uh, and uh, uh, i would uh, have preferred to have this as interactive as possible but i can understand that given the medium uh, that may not be automatically uh, possible so what i will do is i will first speak uh, in the course of speaking i will talk a little bit about the topic of memory poetry and architecture i will read uh, some poems that i have written uh, if time permits maybe even one or two poems that i have translated uh, and at the same time i have made a small uh, kind of presentation which is essentially text and images which i hope uh, i i can share my screen and you can uh, have a look at so to kind of begin with the notion of memory poetry and architecture i would uh, think that in this particular case it could be a very very personal uh, kind of uh, uh, talk or rumination on the subject because for each one of us we are people who have memories that kind of remain sometimes at the back of the mind sometimes they come to the foreground sometimes they make us recognize things uh, you have all types of memories but once you kind of join architecture Uh, i think the one thing that starts to activate more than anything else is what one may call visual memory okay the things that you see are the things that get embedded in your head and then those visuals from time to time kind of uh, keep making their uh, presence felt in my case in the writing of poetry so uh some of those uh, images i would like to share also with you uh, in the course of uh, this presentation however because poetry is essentially a medium <clears throat> that is written that has text in it okay or that is spoken and is heard in both these cases you do not normally have images uh, to to kind of uh be there you know when when a poetry is presented or read or uh, put in a text what i am going to do after a point is slightly unnatural 
Okay, it is not the normal way of doing things. The reason is this, that when you hear poetry, okay, it, the moment somebody reads poetry, or the moment you read uh, poetry on the page, it belongs to you entirely as a listener. Okay, in one sense, I have always believed that the poet then takes a backseat. And the way you look at the poem, the way it goes into your mind, uh, the way you imagine or the images that are evoked in the form of uh, the poem are entirely yours, entirely personal and entirely correct in the sense that there is no one precise way in which any poem can be looked at, any poem can be understood. Which is why probably people also find poetry to be difficult. Okay, most of the time they say, okay, we cannot understand what is it. All right. Uh, that's because you want an explanation. That's because you want something to be made clear. However, if you try it in the other way, to kind of simply absorb the words for yourself and try and see how they unfold in your own mind, you will get a very enriching uh, experience. The, that experience will become a very uh, you know, vivid, uh, maybe a very colorful, a very textured uh, uh, experience, a very visual sometimes uh, experience that only you in your mind can uh, make and i think that is how we can judge the success uh, of a good poem and also because the responsibility is there on the person who is hearing the poem we can judge the success of whether the person who is listening to the poem has uh, been able to you know get uh, the poem and make it their own so uh, with that, I would think that what you should do is that I'm going to read mostly my poems in this session, uh, one or two which I have not written. But uh, as far as you are concerned, they are all yours. Okay, and you have to kind of make the, the poems yours by listening to them and allowing them to kind of seep in uh, to your own uh, understanding. And most importantly, please remember this, that it will play with your own memories. Okay, these poems will interact with the memories that you already have and create uh, a new form, uh, which neither I as the person who has written them, nor you as a person who has not heard the poem, uh, can determine because once you hear them and these poems sift and filter through your own memories, they will become entirely different things. Uh, that's my uh, hope, okay? And uh, let's see if this uh, works out. That doesn't mean we cannot talk about it uh, or that doesn't mean that I, I close doors and say, you know, I will not explain anything. It's not like that. But first, you allow the poems to make their mark on you, and then we can see what to do. So with your permission, I'll just share screen. So uh, like I said, that some of the poems I have uh, put in the slides, so you can even read them as I'm reading them. The slightly longer ones, I have not done that. And uh, just let's see how it goes. So I'm going to. Uh, begin with a poem that uh, I, pub I was uh, lucky enough to get published almost 30 years ago. This is the first poem that I ever got published in a book of poetry. And uh, as you will be able to see, this contains a lot of what are called archetypal images of architecture, which means they are not very specific but they are very general uh, images of architecture, which you all know. And that is why each one of you can see them different. Okay, and uh, just see how you like this. So the title of this poem is 
there is a hunger in houses. There is a hunger in houses that can't solace breast. Roof lines or skywards, cables get stretched, shingles accept a foot of pilaster, buttresses preclude slippage, disaster, arches fake glazing, rooftops crack dormers, see through spectacles. Cables bear armor. Updated wallpapers crumble too soon. Children tear crescents of a paper moon. Wives remark darkly on suit formation. Cut back on nag sounds. Ward off starvation. Sinks chug sewage. Post meal slop. Casements chew fingers. Window panes drop. Fluff beds shake down for calculated rests. Doors shut on themselves, lids of old treasure chests. Now, this poem has a, a particular kind of rhyme sequence, as you can see. Uh, in that sense, it is uh, perhaps the kind of poem that uh, the, the type of poems that you would have learned in school, you know, because uh, poetry that rhymes has been a very classical kind of way of doing things. Uh, I, I, I can't do that anymore. There was a time when I could write poetry like this, but that time has kind of gone. However, the subjects and the content, I think, are still uh, relevant. Uh, even though today I write what is called free verse, you know, non-rhyming uh, kind of uh, poems. So uh, the importance of this poem is the way in which we convert memories in our head, in this case about architecture, about architectural elements, about elements in the interior of houses, and we generalize. Okay? So later on, poems get much more specific than this. But this is a much more broader kind of uh, way of doing things. Memory works in many different ways as well. Okay? And uh, one of the important things I think for all of us currently is that almost none of us, I think, have sat in a local train for the last seven months. Uh, and uh, I want to read this poem out more like the memory of traveling in local trains. Uh, this is uh, in the form of what is called a haiku, which is a Japanese form of uh, poetry that cons consists of very specific syllables uh, in three lines. So you have a line with five, then seven, then five uh, syllables. And you have to kind of convey the meaning through that. Uh, this is a poem describing the experience of local trains in Bombay. Uh, I think, uh, I, I don't know how many of you may realize this, but all of our lifetime, except maybe in the last five years or seven, eight years, all trains used to be colored the same. You know, it. It was yellow on top and brown below. And that was the way, if you look at old photographs of local trains, that is how you will uh, see them. So this is a haiku. Uh, incidentally, the last line of this uh, poem also became the title of my first book of poems, which is this one, called Brew Ha Ha's of Cox. Uh, Merry morning locals. Yellow brown slugs grind steel teeth. Cluckety cluck sparks. Bruhahas of cocks. Uh, so the, the notion of morning, the notion of trains moving in the morning, and the, the, the almost the metaphor of how a cock normally crows in the morning to announce the morning. All these three things are kind of combined 
in the writing of this uh, poem. Uh, so the traveling by the local train is such an important kind of part of our lives uh, that several poems actually, uh, I, I did write poems about the experience of traveling in local trains, but at the same time, when you do so, certain things kind of catch your eye, uh, even for a split second, okay? And they remain forever in your head. And that is how memories kind of, uh, how vivid memories can be. Uh, this poem, which I want to read, uh, is literally the memory of one such thing. What I am reading in the first verse, actually, I saw that. Okay, however funny it sounds. Uh, and then the, what I saw kind of led to the writing of this uh, poem. <clears throat> this poem is from my first uh, book of poems and is called Bird Upside Down. I'm no ornithologist, but I swear there's a pigeon's foot poking out of that man's trouser pocket. I see a blue-gray feather, a further affront to my reality. The man moves with as much care for his charge as loose change. I turn away impulsively, steer clear of the pink talon, Prognosis of tetanus and rabies clash with the confusion of brushing against the living or the dead. The claw clenches. Why would a bird allow itself to keep a karmic carriage upside down in a man's pocket? Does it clutch an adjustment twisting to find a better position to indignantly peck the man's cuddle bone, but is insurrection tempered by the prospect of birdie num num soon after? Or does it ease and stretch for comfort to snuggle into the warmth of his crotch, commit itself to salad dreams of warm updrafts and homing posts? Does it accept the avian condition a nonchalance of loosened limbs. The man shimmies through forests of hips, his hand always kept close to his heart where he keeps his cell phone and a packet of cigarettes. As I read this poem now, I'm suddenly struck by uh, how relevant it is perhaps in our own times of social distancing, okay? Because when I wrote this poem, that was the thought that when you see something as crazy as a bird in a man's pocket, uh, you, you, you would tend to keep away, you would tend to keep the distance because you don't want to get scratched by that, okay? Uh, and uh, yeah, so... Uh, this poem must have been written about 15 years, more than 15 years ago, but still, you know, it, it comes out in various ways. One can read. I think this is the interesting thing about poetry is that you can read the same poem depending on when you read it, and it might sound completely uh, different to you as well. And uh, I think that is perfectly all right. Too. Uh, talking about memories, I'll read a few poems which are based on specific works uh, of architecture or art uh, that got mixed into the memories and kind of emerged at various points in the form of poems. Uh, and this image which you can see is one of the great works of art uh, in, in the post-Renaissance period. It's about this big, okay? And what it is, is uh, it's called a salt cellar, which is essentially something you keep on the table 
and then in the box which you see in front uh, there is a there is salt kept and maybe pepper and things like that to be used on a uh, dining table but obviously this is something done for kings and the whole thing is made in gold and has amazing uh, precious stones embedded and uh, the image here is that of neptune who is the god of the sea uh, who is holding that that trident which looks like a fork uh, so this is a great work of art but it's also one of the heaviest objects of gold and this poem which i wrote uh, was more of an idea than anything else and that was uh, you all probably heard this uh, fairly uh, mythical idea that in the middle ages uh, a lot of people uh, actually developed chemistry because they they wanted to turn lead into gold and they thought that they could do that by you know chemical processes by you know doing things to lead and turning it into gold uh, in this poem i have talked about doing exactly the opposite uh, you know turning gold into lead and this is how it reads coins watches and teeth as a matter of fact coins watches and teeth is a reference to the the nazi holocaust uh, in uh, in uh, before the second world war when a lot of the jews were kind of uh, herded into concentration camps and then they were killed and after they were killed all the things that belonged to them were taken away and one of the things that was really looked at as valuable for the nazis was gold so whether they found coins gold coins gold watches or even gold teeth they would all be collected melted and reused so here is the poem coins watches and teeth with tears brimming they drop chelenis salt cellar into the vat the orum churns binding agents coins watches and teeth turn black congealed lumps are lifted semi dry and rolled by hand bark cutters wrap birch around the wobbly core alchemists have been working overtime to return their gold to lead the world needs a pencil the universe a word this next poem is of course inspired by this absolutely iconic building uh, which is by antoni gaudi uh, in barcelona called casa batlo Uh, it is uh, uh, an apartment block built in the middle of a fairly busy uh, street, which already had earlier buildings, and was actually a remodeled building of uh, uh, which existed earlier. But when Gaudi remodeled it, he kind of converted it into this mind-blowing piece of fantastic architecture. Uh, as a matter of fact i gave a lecture on fantastic architecture only two days back and i used these images so i am kind of using some of that to show it to you uh, what is interesting about this poem and this building is that this is not just a building that is visually very attractive to look at uh, but at the same time it also conveys ideas and one of the important ideas it conveys is the symbolic uh, the symbolic kind of roof which you can see in this image and that roof uh, which looks like the back of a dragon you know with all those scales and things like that uh, also has a spear which emerges from it and ends in a cross and that is a symbol of saint george uh, who very famously killed the dragon and is a you know as his sign of uh victory of good over evil uh but at the same time saint george is also the saint 
of Catalonia, which is the part of Spain where Barcelona is uh, the, the local capital of Catalonia. And Catalonia has always had problems with Madrid, which is the capital of the country. Uh, Gaudi considered himself to be a, a very cutter Catalonian, shall we say. And through his buildings also, he conveys these ideas. Uh, Gaudi was also a deeply, deeply religious man, and he spent most of his life working on the great cathedral in the middle of Barcelona called the Sagrada Familia. Okay. And he gave up everything just to work on that, uh, to the point that he would even not bother about you know whether his clothes were fresh and new and so on. And the story goes that in his old age one day, he was knocked down by in a street accident and lay dying for many hours before people even recognized him because they thought he was a beggar or something like that. And then he died and that is one of the great losses to uh, Barcelona. Uh, and this notion of Catalonia, of the architecture, uh, of the symbol of the roof of Sagrada Familia and the death of Gaudi uh, are ideas that I have all kind of brought together in this uh, poem. So while I'm going to read this poem out to you, I'm going to show you a series of close-ups of uh, uh, Casa Batlo and sculpture from the Sagrada Familia. And uh, these are images uh, which uh, I have uh, received from an alumnus of our college. Uh, her name is Hemangi Kadu, who she is an absolutely brilliant photographer. And these are images taken this year itself. Uh, and uh, I'm very thankful to her, but you can see uh, when you go up close to this building, how fabulous uh, the textures of the building are. So, Casa Batlo. The great reptile gazes down at the deliberate fissure of new Spain. Pinchered scales click in climatic readjustment, cutting off rays the sunset scatters over ceramic shards. From his vantage, the Catalonian knight measures the cardinal's glance, facing down the next hundred years, seeing much, doing nothing. Carapace cackling in the heat of the Barcelona sunset, the reptile spares barely a glance at the falling man, instead tightens his scalene grip on the bedrock. His claws append the earth in funicular steadiness. Barcelona gathers to watch. The envoy from Madrid avoids his touch, enters under whitewashed pediments, to regular eight course meals. The cross of Batlo, the gecko at Guel, denizens from the sea swept crags of Mila, half executed angels from the familia, ignore the man in the torn overcoat, the receding clip clops of the hit and run cart. They have their own agendas and could wait out the martyrdom of another Catalan patriot rather than spare a thought for a decrepit body that, lie, that lies down in the larger scheme of life. So uh, these are the fantastic images of uh, Gaudi's work. And uh, at some point in time in life, I think everyone should visit the many buildings that he has done in, uh, in Barcelona. Uh, here is uh, another uh, poem also of interest, I hope. Uh, 
I wonder if some of you remember uh, this image. Uh, this is uh, the image of a karyatid. Uh, and you may have studied this when you studied the Acropolis in Greece. A karyatid is a column shaped like a woman uh, who is bearing the weight of the building on her head. Uh, typically, this is seen in Greek, uh, or it starts in Greek architecture, classical Greek architecture, where the karyatid is a symbol of women who have been imprisoned by the Greeks because during a war with the Persians, they kind of sided with the Persians. So these women are called the women of Karyai, and they are always, uh, it, in, in, in this building, it is symbolically uh, shown that they will always bear the burden of what they have done by having to take the weight of the entire building on their head. Now, uh, the karyatid then became a, a trope. You know, this is not, this is specific to only one building. And this is an image you can see uh, of a karyatid from the Erechtheion uh, in Athens. But one can see this in many different places as well. And I was inspired to write uh, this poem after looking at a series of karyatids uh, in, on a building in Vienna, in Austria, and subsequent images, you will see that, uh, uh, see that. And I wrote this poem addressing the ladies uh, who are carrying the burden of uh, the whole building on their heads by saying that, okay, let me share your burden. You know, you can take your head away and I will put my head under the column and take the weight of the column uh, of the building for some time. And uh, of course, I'm not very good at it. And that is what the poem uh, conveys. Uh, the, the poem also refers to another sculpture by the very famous French uh, sculptor Auguste Rodin. And you will see an image of that as well. So let me just read out the poem. Karyate. Go on, amble down Augustinus Strasse. I can relieve you for a bit. I know of the burdens of the world. Allow your sisters to massage your shoulders. They do not need hands to bear the burdens of this world. Like their Athenian sorority, destined to oversee the golden city, it's the right tilt of head that holds up the edifice. Maidens of Karyai, constantly aware, constantly looked at, keep a vigil for prodding selfie sticks just outside the library on the Josef's Platz. She holds the Echinus in place while I replace my head with hers and allow her burden to sink onto my skull. I see a skip in her step. She saunters off. Her chiton swishes, a twinkle of ankle. The burden I am left with settles all too quickly. The ladies notice this, grunt and turn away. They eye each other knowingly, whisper in Farsi behind my back, insinuate that their sister may never come back. She's off to rescue their fallen sister from Rodin's gates. You may know what burden is, but we know the meaning of punishment. My shoulders wobble, my weight translates from left leg to right, bringing an unforeseen symmetry in the ensemble outside the Pallavicini. My neck gives way, a piece of pediment crumbles, just missing a Korean group bound by Bluetooth and peacock feather. You had only one job, they tell me, 
you did not have to like it. Just another Harry Lime you, all arc lights and curtains. They shunt me out. Order is restored. Man, you should stick to poetry. Leave the burdens of the world to us. So this is what the karyatids in Vienna look like. Uh, they are very beautifully carved and uh, you can see how the weight of the building kind of comes down uh, on their heads. Uh, this of course was carved, uh, this, these sculptures are from the late 1700s. Uh, the Erection where the original karyatid is, is from about 400 BC. So there is such a long period of time when in different buildings you saw uh, columns made in the shape of humans. So architecture plays tricks on us in various ways, you know, by uh, kind of surprising us sometimes uh, from time to time with these visions of things that we have already seen which then get intermingled with many other things and they kind of all mix together in a way that you can never uh, entirely, you know, figure out why uh, something is the way it is. Uh, so what I want to do now, and I must say that I had to take a little effort to, to do this, uh, is to read out a poem uh, which is essentially the description of a city. If you like, you may call it a description of Bombay city. It doesn't matter. But uh, in the course of this poem, uh, so many memories, uh, some of them even from childhood, all kind of made their way and kind of got inserted into the way the city uh, is described. Uh, and some of those memories are so intensely visual that I have uh, brought them here and you can see uh, the things that, uh, that, that influence the visuals uh, that are there in, this, in the words. So what I would like you to do is to not look for meaning uh, too much other than appreciating uh, the, the words of the poem itself, because these are memories that are completely personal to me. Uh, and of course I can explain each one of them, but that would take far too long. Uh, suffice it to say that this is a poem describing a city. And the name of this poem is Traumstadt, which is a German word, which means dream city. And Traumstadt is also the title of a painting done by the great modernist painter uh, of the Bauhaus, as a matter of fact, called Paul Klee uh, in 1921. And this is an image of Dream City. And like I said, as I read the poem, I will uh, show you a series of images which have meaning to me but I hope can be very interesting to look at nevertheless. So Traumstadt. Whose shadows remain unsilent while the girl runs away with stick and wheel. The stumpy hirsute observes tamping down his jekyll cell. The constable scars for iterant Valjeans, wants no Rambos on his beat. Shopkeepers keep the peace. The gods forsaken, what scales the thirst for grace? Thermals sweep through passages and fretwork. Temperatures drop. The whistle dusk takes apnoic breath aspirates like a punctured lung. The siren is monotone, a strain from a Neanderthal bone flute. Arcades fold 
in the manner of accordions, divide into more arches. Vuswar's cross brace entwine like caduceae, buttress the skyline. Sonambulants adjust in Caligari coffins, smile for no reason at all. There must be some purpose to spires in a place of no religion. Dry retching out of ink, the croquil scratches parchment, the city recomposed. So you can see how many things can go into the making of a poem and from how many different sources uh, your inspiration kind of uh, can be percolated into a single poem. Now, I'm perfectly sure that if I had read this poem without the images, what you would be seeing in your mind would be completely different. As a matter of fact, it would be different even with the images uh, that I have uh, presented to you. So, Perhaps the best thing that one can do is to appreciate a poem without images at all and try to make what you can make out of it. These are poems that, uh, or this poem which I want to read especially uh, is something that I would like you to uh, bear with me and do as I tell you, which is essentially just close your eyes. As I read this poem, let the words become images in your own head uh, throughout this poem, okay? And, and maybe later on, tell me what you see uh, in, the, in the process of this. So this is a poem called My Room, and very literally, it is just that. It is the description of a room, okay? Uh, through words. So, like I suggest, close your eyes and just see whatever you see. My room. One. The fifteenth coat of gold on the granite crag satisfies me. It is done, put in place. The concrete tray has 778 stones. I add this last one, my epitaph. This stone is the largest. The inscription, 15 patches of gold made into one. A spotlight picks up the gold. The epitaph glows, but not overtly so. Look upon the elements of my life. My epitaph flashes messages in golden morse. The stones are keys. Each tells of where I found it. Never more than one from any one place. Two. I sleep on a sea of ochre. On carpets stretch taut wall to wall. They press into my skin, make marks that ripple and wave. Sometimes I twist and turn, the ripples cross hatch. All carpets end at walls plastered in cow dung. Walls are cool. You can rest against them. They turn warm in light that you can read by. The walls are soft to touch. You can still see marks left by bristles of a wet brush. This is the conformation of the wall. When it dries, its final words, I read them over and over. The walls dampen words to whispers. Here, we rarely speak. There are no greens in my room. 
if you want any come dressed in green then my room welcomes you so do i you go well with the stones my room has one window it is narrow and it is tall divided four ways by sashes outside you can see half a tree you get four views of half a tree you can look at them together or one by one they don't object sometimes the branches swing i can't hear the sounds outside i play music to the dipping of branches it cleans my room of clutter four my windows my window faces east that is not my doing each morning the sun comes through four rays enter the room three are damped in ochre the fourth reflects off the patch of gold on my epitaph this wakes me gently my epitaph is now also my alarm clock so tell me now what you saw in uh in in this uh poem in your own mind uh i'm sure it must have come off as something interesting something vivid something unusual but it is your own memories that make the image that you are uh, looking at uh, that you are observing and maybe even thinking about okay so everything that you have already allows you to uh, read this poem in your own uh, in your own sort of way okay uh, i'm going to kind of deviate uh in a small way by uh doing a couple of readings of poems that i have translated and amongst my activities as a writer of poetry is also a translator of poetry and i i have translated uh poems from two or three languages uh so far some more some less uh, i'd like to read two translations for you but i will read the originals as well uh, this is another thing which i can encourage you all to do and that is to read things from languages which you are not familiar with which are not your own if you are predominantly english speaking like i am then read languages uh, say your mother tongue okay or or languages around you uh, so we are all blessed we are probably one of the very few people in the world who are all multilingual okay i don't think there's a single one of us who will say that i can speak only one language okay all of us can speak three or four and we are so rich in this we should not kind of lose uh, the the enjoyment of other languages as well uh, because for me in the act of translation i find that because i translate from other languages into english what i write in english also transforms okay so a uh, couple of poems one is a very short and very very lovely poem uh, this is written by my friend and absolutely mind blowing poet himan divke uh this was written many years ago and himan divte is part of a new set of contemporary poets in marathi who are doing amazing things with marathi language probably even more experimental than things say done in english and uh, i would encourage you especially the wangmai mandal to explore new marathi writing uh, especially poetry uh especially the new writers uh who are currently writing doing some fantastic stuff 
so you have Himan Devte as one of the people at the forefront. He is also a publisher. He has published three of my books, but he is also a mind-blowing poet. And he has just got a new book of poems out uh, called Paranoia. Uh, this is from a very early uh, uh, book of his. And uh, the, I, the poem is called uh, Full Pakhra. Full Pakhra. Complex cha garden made firtana. Mi sahaj mitrala matla. Are. Gard pyolya ranga chi choti full pakra. Isatats nai halli. Tar to sahajats manala. To brand ata bandas hala. That's the poem. Okay, it's a fabulous poem. You know, uh, it is part of, it wasn't written that way, but it is part of what today we would call eco poetry, which is essentially poetry written about uh, the changing ecosystems, changing climates, uh, and, you know, how the world around us is transforming uh, in, in so many. Uh, you know, uh, very un uh, kind of forgivable ways that we may not, we will lose so many things and we will not be able to uh, replace them. In this one set of five, six lines, he has been able to convey uh, what is really happening in our con uh, contemporary world. Uh, it's a simple enough poem. The translation is this way, butterflies. Delvi, sir. Del Delvi, sir. Yes, Rajiv. Can you read butterflies once again? I am trying to record it. In Marathi? In Marathi only. Yeah, I think this is superb. Sure. I request you, sir, once again. No problem. I'll do it. I called someone to the screen to hear it again. Okay, sure. I'll read it again. Yeah, because you... Huh, thanks. Uh, this is a poem by Heman Divte. Full Pakhra. Complex cha garden made firtana, me sahaj mitrala matla, are gard pivya ranga chi choti pul pakra, disatats nahi halli, tar to sahajats manala, to brand ata bandha sala hai. In English, butterflies. While rambling through the garden of my housing complex, Apropos of nothing, I told a friend, you know, these days, we don't see those small, common yellow butterflies anymore. To which he casually replied, that brand has been discontinued. Thank you so much. <laughs> this is superb. It is a lovely poem, isn't it? Hey, superb, absolutely. Uh, I'd like to read another poem uh, to you. You don't mind. And this one is in Urdu by the great poet Faiz Ahmed Faiz. Uh, and I'll read it to you in Urdu and then my translation in English. And you can see how uh, very beautifully he conveys the sense of place, the sense of uh, location, even elements of architecture that come together to form a poem, which is essentially describing sham or dusk or the evening falling. Okay? And uh, the words he uses are so rich and so delightful. Which is, of course, why one translates, okay? You don't translate just because of the exercise. You translate because the words you read, you enjoy so much in their original language that you have this feeling that, okay, you know, suppose this were a poem in English, how would it be? And that is the, the, the great desire and motivation for translations. So here is Sham by Faiz Ahmed Faiz. इस तरह है हर एक कोई मंदिर है कोई उजड़ा हुआ बेनूर पुराना मंदिर ढूंढता है 
जो खराबी के बहाने कम साख हर बाम हर एक दर का दाम आखिर है आसमान कोई पुरोहित है तो हर बाम तले जिस्म पर राख मले माथे पे सिंदूर मले सर गिनू बैठा है आप न जाने कब से इस तरह है कि पासे पर्दा कोई साहिर है जिसने आफाक पे फैलाया है यू शहर का दाम दामने वक्त से पैवस है यू दामने शाम अब कभी शाम बुझेगी न अंधेरा होगा अब कभी रात ढलेगी न सवेरा होगा आसमान आस लिए है कि ये जादू टूटे चुप की जंजीर कटे वक्त का दामन छूटे दे कोई शंख दुआई कोई पायल बोले कोई बुत जागे कोई सावली घूंघट खोले absolutely beautiful writing uh here is the translation dusk it's like this every tree is a temple a bleak old ruined shrine that seeks under the guise of its own ruination the last breath of every falling doorway every roof coming apart at the seams the sky is a priest who perch on every rooftop anoints his body with ash his brow with sindoor how long has he been silent and bowed no one knows it's as if a magician secreted behind a curtain has pulled a vast trick over the entire firmament linking time's mantle to the vestments of dust now will twilight never give way to darkness nor the night give way to dawn the sky still lives in hope for this spell to break for chains of quietude to unfasten for time's fabric to unravel for a sacred conch to blow for the dancers anklets to sing for the idols to awake for the dusky maiden to come forth unveiled all right uh okay uh so very recently in fact in the lockdown this was entirely a project of the lockdown uh i wrote a set of poems about the experience uh, of people during the lockdown in the first few months and uh, i sent it off to a publisher who very uh, gracefully immediately accepted uh, the set of poems and published it already as a ebook uh, so this is a small book which uh, which is bought only on the internet and uh, can be read only on your computer or your laptop it doesn't have a physical <clears throat> uh, print uh, edition uh, so these poems are collectively titled walk they are 18 poems uh, they are very short poems the the brief which i gave myself was that each poem should have only 10 lines or not more than that so they are really short and in that i tried to convey my feeling of how the migrants uh, throughout india were forced to leave the cities because suddenly jobs uh, because of the lockdown you remember in march uh, jobs were stopped because nobody could move out of their houses and money was stopped and people were staying on rent who could not pay their rent had to leave and many people feeling almost you know going towards the point of starvation said that it's better to go home you know where they came from rather than work in the cities where they work however there was no transportation and so we had as you will all remember this 
remarkable uh, event of people walking miles and kilometers across the country going from their the city where they work to their hometowns sometime absurd lengths like 500 kilometers and 1000 kilometers and even then uh, you know not finding uh, comfort so this was a very traumatic period not even 6 months back that inspired these poems uh they are unusual for me because it's not the kind of uh way i write poems i don't normally write about the current uh time uh but this event was uh something that led to the writing of these so i would like to read two or three of these these are fairly short uh poems and i have tried to also try some uh different things in this so i will begin by a poem called night walkers uh which is essentially a description of masses of people walking through cities going from town to highway to town to highway and so on uh, most of the time walking at night when it is cooler uh but not finding uh, any comfort uh, in any place night walkers night walkers glide through tier 3 towns zephyrs susurrate through streets rise to murmurations then fall silent rivulets meet break to mescent quick silver never reaching a momentum that would lead to deluge no hive mind this everyone remains the nayak of their own story the desire for relief is a bucket of cold water poured over every glowing ember of revolution this next poem is called thali peet uh, which everyone knows what thali peet is if you are from maharashtra but here of course i am using it as a pun uh, to describe that very funny event which happened i think towards the end of march where everyone was called to come out on their balconies and bang utensils uh, in in support of uh, the doctors who were uh, treating coronavirus and so on but uh, this poem is essentially about the same migrants who are walking through the streets uh, and are suddenly surprised with all this noise which is happening around them so thali peet and so it comes to pass as the flock leaves the incandescent canyons of ghodbandar road they are startled by an almighty clangor all eyes move upwards to satvik balconies from whence rise a cacophony of heavy metal the crashing of rolling pins on steel bartans the riffing of serving spoons on thalis the drill is familiar standard operating procedure back home to shoo away locusts and pestilent langurs warning past they quicken their pace so people who are walking through the city suddenly with all this noise around them only feel that it is for them and it is like they are being chased away from the city uh, itself one of the uh, things that influenced these poems was you know you find these very interesting things written behind trucks painted behind trucks and the whole experience of migrants was also the experience of walking on highways or trying to find lifts in trucks and all that and behind trucks you have things written like you know buri nazar wale tera muh kala or horn okay please one of the things that also is seen behind trucks and you can even find it in cities behind rickshaws and things like that uh, is this line called ghar kab aoge 
and it is normally uh, seen along with a painting of a woman who is looking in the distance waiting for her lover or her husband to come back so uh, this is a poem called ghar kab aoge uh, it is in the in the voice of one such woman who is waiting for her husband to come back who is at present walking back wherever he is so she is uh, in that position of uh, just you know waiting and hoping ghar kab aoge your last whatsapp was 14 days ago i was 14 when you were married to me now you only have the clothes on your back does it matter what are clothes between us but impediments to annihilation i wait by the door with a bottle of salve for your blistered feet have a care all roads to home are barred and guarded come by the way of roofs here as you did when i was 13 uh, oh, i'll read two poems these are kind of intertwined poems because they talk about the same location uh, the first uh, poem is in the form of a series of whatsapp messages and the second poem is essentially about that place uh, and they are the same place of course whatsapp messages are uh, obviously to someone who is on the road and is uh, are are instructions given uh, to what that person or group of people should do the name of this poem is whatsapp may 2nd 10:13 pm leave highway enter town see jai mata di garage ignore go past mandi empty use nose to find jai shri ram tea house abul matin runs things talk nicely and he'll even give you a naan khatai or two to dip in his adrak chai stay as long as you like best leave by midnight forget not if you hear siren hide if you see police run and this next poem is called lockdown which is about the same place but there are no humans there at all because everything is in a complete state of lockdown so what is a small town like without people uh, on the roads lockdown the painted god king on the rolling shutter of the jai shri ram vaishnav tea house offers salvation not libation a bitch has had a letter on the stoop mother is well her peripatetic spouse has his way with a severed hand jai mata di garage is now a chassis cemetery murderous covens of crows convene on corpses of trucks tires roll out of this one street town all by themselves okay uh so well i think uh, these are the a whole set of poems that i have written some many years ago some fairly fresh i hope uh, you have enjoyed listening to them and i hope that they have evoked different things in your mind uh if at all because of what i have read you have got this feeling that you should read more poetry then of course i have succeeded in what i have done uh in any case it is nice to be 
exposed to uh, poetic writings from time to time. So uh, thank you all for listening to me. And uh, I hope we can open this out for any uh, questions or uh, comments from your side. So thanks a lot. Yes, sir, that was a very interesting and thought provoking question. And I hope we can have a very interactive discussion now. So if uh, the people on Zoom, if they can unmute themselves and ask questions to sir, or even post it in the chat box, we can convey it to sir. Well, I enjoyed every moment of it. I enjoyed every word of it. Thank I nourished so much, every bit of it. And I can't get enough of it. I would love that you continue. But I don't know, you know, there might be there questions is from the time. students. Yeah. yeah, and uh, students might have some very interesting questions. So I so guess... I'm looking uh, forward to that. Yeah, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah. Hello, sir. Yeah, hi. Neha. Yeah, hi. Yeah, hi, sir. How are you doing? I'm fine. Yeah, hi to Rajiv, sir, also. So um, it was a delight to actually listen to your poem and writings. I just wanted to ask the first encounter when you started writing and got into this, you know, there is a difference between a poem and what we write. So when that really happened and when you started really enjoying or when you started connecting it to architecture, because the title also says that poetry, spaces and architecture. So just to go back into time it's difficult to answer that because i used to write poetry even before i joined architecture so after joining architecture it's simply that you know the whole world of architecture got embedded into the poetry that i wrote and i have to tell you that all my poems are not on architecture most definitely not yeah in fact very few are and I have tried to pick out many of those uh, purposely for this presentation. So poetry is written about a variety of things and a variety of influences. Architecture infiltrates poetry like a virus simply because after we joined architecture, because it's a professional course, we start using the language of architecture. And then that language becomes our language. And it comes out even in everyday language. Okay. Uh, I, I remember, uh, you know, when we were in college, one of our classmates running behind another guy wanting to beat him up. Okay. And catching him and saying, Main tera structure badal dunga. Okay. Now, that is the sort of thing you would only do when you were studying architecture, isn't it? Because that <laughs> language kind of comes out. Uh, you know, in, in different ways. And in my case, it comes out in poems. Yeah. So uh, later, uh, did any point of time it happened that poetry started influencing the way you perceive architecture or just, you know, the other way around of maybe? Well, these, these are uh, completely syncretic experiences, okay? And yeah. they cannot be differentiated in any way. They are part of life's larger experiences, which you can look at as a whole and not yeah. uh, break them down into a uh, compartment saying, does this influence this? Something like that. No. Things get added, you know? Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Yeah. Uh, hello. Yeah, Sushma here. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Sushma. Hi. Yeah, actually, I mean, as uh, you know, my students said, thought provoking and uh, Marathi Mare Sangilatar last year lockdown, uh, you know, poems over Sunna Karun Takanarya Kavita, so, I would say. And Thank really, you. I mean, uh, yeah, it is, it is actually, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, lockdown as everyone, everyone is, you know, feeling that and maybe, you know, you have uh, uh, kind of you know, expressed it, uh, you know, uh, I would not say delightful, but it, it is like, you know, it's it just hitting you kind of thing. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, everyone is feeling that, but you have expressed it. So, yeah, and expressed Thank it very well. I'm glad it has succeeded yes. in that way. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, so, just to mention, as you were telling that, uh, while reading out the My Room poem, so in that you mentioned that what pictures come through your mind in front of your eyes when it's closed. So, uh, I just want to share those few uh, images which came in my mind. So, 
as on when you mentioned about the materialistic in your like few lines like when it was more related uh, in the first uh, one about the concrete so i i was basically thinking about the room which i mostly uh, be in the concrete places that becomes my living room every time not just in my home but in my friend's home as well i be in his living room but we both are in there at the same time and when you mentioned about the cow cow dung and it become in dry and everything so i suddenly get shifted to my uh, village so where we had that sort of a uh, home around there and the kind of living rooms and the room which i have been so by changing of the material it just shifted me one place to another and got the images of that few glimpses of that yeah, so i was trying to convey the idea of different textures uh, you know so whether they are concrete or stone or cow dung and especially the idea of cow dung being both cool as well as relatively soft as compared to other materials which allows you to create patterns on it you know when you spread it and so on uh, and they then become the the interior space in which you are in so that that was the intention so i would like to ask as many of us we have different ways of to express yourself through poems and as we went through you have to narrate the things you saw so uh, like how capable you think is the poet as an way of expression like a poem as an way of expression uh, i didn't understand your question when you say how capable what do you mean by that uh so like uh, through your poems even like i read your poems on instagram so you like to write the memories which you have like which you see so how efficient were they when you started to write them down like when i try to write myself few poems sometimes i get stuck i'm very clear with what experience i had but sometimes i'm not able to convert those in words so like if i'm stuck that way what are the things you do when you start writing a poem okay if you want to know a little bit about how poems are written uh, i can tell you my own experience of writing poems and that is that i i don't write very regularly so poems are very very difficult for me to bring out of my head and put on paper okay and it might be that okay i have all these books published and all that but each poem is hard work okay so it just doesn't come out very easy and when it does come out most of the time whatever is first on paper is completely unusable okay after that the real work starts and then in a sense the work of the poet is not very different from the work of the designer okay where iteratively you start to work on your design and make it better and better and better and better and at some point you can say okay now this is a design which can be presented to someone the same thing is true with poetry after you write down your poem okay it is in a very raw shape and it does require you to spend a lot of time editing it working with the words which are now already out of you out of your mind and your body and on paper and they are being improved upon to kind of uh be put forth into the world uh, outside i have said this before somewhere else that i do not write poems just for myself this may be a different experience for other people but as far as i am concerned all poetry is meant to be shared with other people okay the poem has value only when other people read it okay so that's why also you will probably find that there are no they are not those very typically personal poems uh in in my in my writings but then that is a problem with me not with uh, the notion of poetry but the fact is that if you want your poems to be read by other people then once you write them you have to spend time working on them and make them you know reader worthy so to speak so that is how i work with my poems thank you sir are there any more questions from the audience 
So this has been going out on yes. Facebook as well, right? Yes, sir. So uh, the yes, audience sir. on Facebook. Hello. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, we have known you as a teacher and uh, have seen how you teach. Uh, it was a very different experience to hear your poems and see you as a poet. Uh, uh, now we came to know that uh, how you are thinking and how you used to uh, teach us is uh, uh, has some impact from poet. from poetry and uh, i also write poems but uh, uh, since uh, from uh, since i joined uh, architecture college i am i have not written much poems it, uh, i don't know why but uh, it doesn't means poem uh, they don't come to my mind now i don't know how maybe uh, i want some uh, some tips from you may for that I, I don't know about tips, but I know one thing that architecture does tend to kill a lot of talent that we already had before we joined architecture. I have seen this again and again. You know, people who are very, very good at something or the other, after they join architecture, they stop doing it, and in five years, all that gets lost. I think it's a tremendous waste. Okay, I think just because you are in architecture, it doesn't mean. that you are in such an intense kind of place that everything else has to be forgotten because for me it is exactly the reverse everything that you bring with you into the college of architecture should have some role and some place in what you are doing in the college or while you are learning architecture as well so i mean you are talking about writing poetry other people talk about doing other things uh, one should never stop okay we also have a five year course you know it's a long long time we can always do things slowly and never be greatly obsessed with just one thing so the way to enjoy yourself in an architecture college is to open yourself out to so many things okay and bring them all together uh, and i hope that my poetry is one demonstration of that of many different uh, interests that all come together in a poem perhaps many different interests can all come together in design as well but they will not if you stop doing things so never stop yes sir good evening sir further up uh yeah sir i wanted to ask about the poem uh, my room so it was absolutely fascinating to uh, experience the gradual introduction of different materials and different views in which uh, we see the room right but uh, what the thing which made me more fascinated was when you uh, i i don't know if you did that intentionally or so you uh, told what is outside the room like you introduced what is outside the room and that totally changed what uh, like what the texture look like looks like inside the room what the reflections are what the mentality or psychology of that person sitting in that room is so did you follow a process of uh, gradually uh, doing this or something because i personally found it so fascinating to experience uh, you, you're you're right in a small way uh, in the sense that this is uh, my room is a poem of unfolding you know it it unfolds itself slowly it doesn't all come at you at one shot you know it kind of like a whole series of layers you know it's like an onion where you have layer after layer which which kind of all works together uh, ultimately giving you uh, a combined kind of image so it is also a poem if you if you recall i also read quite slowly okay so that it percolates through your mind as i am reading it and each layer gets added on to what was there earlier to create a richer image uh, so yeah you're right in in that sense that it was done so that it could come at you uh, over a period of time that i read the poem um good evening sir um i wanted to ask okay, you yeah. when you're writing your poems is it a conscious effort or do you just um 
like do you find yourself doing it without a plan or premeditation as such or is it like you start with the skeleton of uh, notes in a notebook uh there is no fixed method although i can assure you that there is no notes in a notebook kind of thing for me uh it is that you know the poem kind of keeps floating in my mind for a period of time and it just goes round and round and round and it gets added to and it changes and so on and so forth uh i run into many roadblocks in my mind itself and then try to see if those can be overcome and then at a certain point which i like i've already told you i find the experience not very enjoyable i sit down and write it okay but then then the fun starts then it is most enjoyable once you have written your poem then now you can start to wrestle with it and you can start to enjoy it uh, and work with it and shape it and make it fine tune it and whatever word you want to call it until it becomes ready for uh, somebody to read so that is my process uh, it is also not very regular i must say so it's not that i sit down every day and follow a certain discipline of writing uh, that has never happened but ideas emerge and you know what a meme is right like a meme they kind of stick in your head and they stay there uh, until either they dissipate in which case there is nothing or they become more and more uh, insistent that you have to write it out so at a certain point you write it out and so when you are writing these down finally how important is um I, i don't know how to put this the, the sound of the poem to you as in um like you said your initial poems had rhyming and the flow of the music of the poem as such um how important is that to you and does it play a part in your writing well it has improved over a period of time this is not uh, something that is automatic uh one of the reasons why the sound of the poem has started to matter is because now i read out poems more and more because i get the opportunities to do that okay we have poetry readings all over the place and i have been very very lucky to be part of a group of poets in bombay who are always part of some reading or the other uh i have consistently read my poems for the last at least 6 7 years at the kalagoda festival uh you know and this is just one example uh i all i have been invited every year for the last 5 or 6 years to the goa arts and literary festival uh amongst other festivals which i have attended so there you are always reading out in front of others and people are listening to the poems just as today you have listened to them so that has definitely played a role in the way i write the poem because ultimately the poem once it is written is on on paper it is a textual uh, kind of thing okay uh, and uh, yeah so that that influence has been there i can tell you the reverse of this as well which is a very very rare kind of thing and definitely i have no talent for it and that is a concept which is called oral poetry okay oral poetry is when poets have all their poems only in their head and at any given time if you put a mic in front of them they can start reciting their poems you know it comes out of their head and it is uh, spoken it is never written down yeah. uh, it's a rare trait it's a rare talent and uh, i i know of only one poet who is really amazing and uh, you all know of him because he was one of the judges of the faculty medal competition uh h masood taj okay he is an architect and also a poet but he is what is called an oral poet so all his poems are in his head and one of these days if you ever catch him here and ask him to come and give a talk 
and say, uh, you know, recite some of your poems, he can probably do two hours of poetry just by, uh, you know, uh, reading poems from his memory directly. Uh, I am not that way. I can't even remember my own poems without reading them. So I think each one is different in their own way. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask. Uh, yes. So, uh, as you mentioned, most of your uh, poems were from your memories, which is the past. And recently, you wrote about the present scenario as well. So, what do you think about writing poems or any literature about future, like predicting? Yeah. Or thoughts based on your experience? Well, I, I don't know how to answer that because uh, poems have their own life. Okay. And uh, like I know that poems which you have read or written at one point in time, 20 years down the line, you can read them and they can mean something entirely different, but still be relevant. Okay. Uh, so, uh, that, that is uh, the, the case and that's how it kind of, uh, it works. I know one thing that if I have written a poem, uh, it is not dead, that the poem is never a dead thing. Okay, in fact, it has, it is immortal because as long as somebody reads it, whether today or whether after 100 years, it will be read differently, it will be absorbed differently, it may be dismissed, it might be said this is rubbish, all that is fine but it will be read, okay? So the, the immortality of the written word, I think is the important thing. So that is why there's always a future. But like I told you in the beginning, it is never a future which you determine. It is always a future that the reader determines. And that is the very important lesson, uh, I think, of today, that it is the way you read the poem, not the way I write it, that will ultimately... Uh, you know, have value uh, in, in the world, in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Sir, I, I, I remember, you know, I remember one statement that I am responsible for what I write, but not for what you understand. No. Something like this. Something. I will write the way I want. Yeah. So it's a nice yeah. way of, of expressing it. I guess that's great. No, I mean, how, how else will it be, you know? That's true. Absolutely. Because, I agree I mean, with you. See, remember that a large <laughs> amount of poems you are reading are of people who are dead. So they're not here to defend you and uh, defend their work. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you either like it or don't like it, it's fine. It stays with you, you pass it on to the next generation. It's life continues. So it's the words which continue, not the person. That's great. That's great. Hello, sir. So I think we would love to continue the discussion, but uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So if sure. you could give us a concluding note, and we can end the session. Uh, well, I have nothing to conclude other than to say how grateful I am for this chance you have given me to uh, read out my poetry. I think in all these years that I have been teaching, it's probably the first time uh, that I have read poems to my own students. So this is a new experience for me as well. Uh, I always thought that these two worlds were slightly different, you know, the architecture college and the, the world of poetry, reading and writing. Today you have given me the chance to kind of bring these two worlds together in a kind of synthesis. And uh, it has been a great experience for me. And I can only hope that for you all as well, it has been something that uh, you could enjoy and maybe a little bit take away from. Uh, I can only end by saying that uh, if you are interested in poetry uh, and you don't have to be a person writing poetry, but if you are interested in poetry, you should definitely, most definitely be a person reading poetry and read as much as you can. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, it just enjoy the fact that everybody is different and there is this huge diversity in writing, in ideas, uh, in the way poetry is communicated. 
do not forget that only two days back the latest nobel prize for literature was announced and the winner of the 2020 nobel prize for literature is a poet okay her name is louise gluck and she is one of america's best known uh, poets so you know i mean nobel prizes are given for poetry as well so you can i i will ask you to go and first explore the poems of louise gluck right they are there all over the internet you can even find youtubes of her reciting and so on and read her work so if you like poetry then read it that is my kind of uh, message for you all so thanks once again for this uh, beautiful event Thank you, sir. I think it was our privilege to hear your poems read out from you. And uh, yeah, we definitely had a lot to take away and I hope many of us go back and read more poems. And uh, we also have a students club for reading and I hope we can uh, extend our discussion to that as well. And if you could join us for a session there as well. Sure, certainly. I think we look forward to all coming together and having the college as it was earlier. And when yes, that happens, sir. I will be more than happy to join you. Yes. So thank you once again. And we can end. All right. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you all.